So what I want to share with you today is, you know, I remember back many years ago when I was working special operations, and, and we had set up a checkpoint. We had information that a, that a really, really dangerous character was coming through the, through the location, and, and so we set up this checkpoint, and, and we were kind of watching with surveillance and everything, and, and so here this car comes that, that fits the, the description, and it just drives, and I'm like, that must not be the person because they're driving very calm. They're, they're calm. They're cool. It's not what I was expected at all. And, and this, this young girl pulls up, and we start checking her identification, and one of the officers notices something in the back of the vehicle. And, and it was actually the guy we were looking for. And we were able to take him into custody safe. And afterwards, I'm talking to the girl because my, my heart is just breaking for this young girl. I knew she'd been, she'd been put up to it. And I said, you saw the red lights. You saw the cop cars. Like, why did you keep driving forward? And she said, all I could see was the mouth of the shark. And it hit me. And I could empathize with the way this girl felt. When she said those words, the mouth of the shark. And I just felt for her at a point in her life that there was no hope, there was no turning around. She just had to go forward, whatever the consequences were. You know, as I'm reading in, in the Gospel of Mark, as Jesus is moving towards Jerusalem, I feel, as I'm reading and preparing for the message, the, I sense that he's moving towards the mouth of the shark. He knows what's happening, and yet he knows his destiny goes with what waits ahead. You know, what I want to tell you, the one thing that the Lord put on my heart was, God's Word tells you what's, what's already happened so that you'll know what will happen. You see, a chaotic and random life is not of God. Jesus tells the disciples and you what has already happened, the Bible, God's words already told us, and what will happen so that y'all have peace in knowing that God is in control of no matter what happens and that all things work for good. I just want to encourage you that a chaotic, random life is not of God. You have the word of the Lord to tell you what has already happened and what will happen. It's just a matter of latching on to the, to the will and being obedient. So the word that brings that assurance is, is our anchor scripture. And if we could stand together as the body, and we will read this as a good word, and it comes from Mark 10, 32, 34. And it's uh, Jesus a third time predicts his death and resurrection. So let's read as the body. Begin. Now they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was going before them. And they were amazed, and as they followed, they were afraid. Then he took the twelve aside again and began to tell them the things that would happen to him. Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles." And they will mock him, and they will scourge him, and they will spit on him, and they will kill him. And on the third day, he will rise again. Amen. That is a good word. I want to share with you. And you know, the Holy Spirit guides our preaching message. We don't lay down and, and lay out some fancy schedule and things. I preach what the Holy Spirit says, and, and it's no coincidence that, that this is, a, this is a, going to be a heavy message. And it's a good time to pause and reflect at this point of the gospel. Things are shifting dramatically for Jesus. You know, so we're going to walk through. Mark 10, 32 says, now they were on the road going to Jerusalem. In the, in the Greek, the word road is hodos. It means a, a way, a system of doctrine the way of the Christian life. What it's saying is Jesus is more than just on a street. He's on the straight and narrow path. There is only one road there. Now, are there other roads to take? There sure are. Matter of fact, Ephesians 6, 10, 11 tells us, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the wiles of the devil. What I will tell you is the word wiles is a combination of words in the Greek, but it means madothio, madothio. And that means what? One road, one path, but to scheme and to plot. You see, Jesus is taking the hodos, not the madothos. Jesus is doing the Father's will. He's not out to scheme and to plot. I want you to understand that there's more than one road to take in life, 
but there's only one road to take to the Father. You see, Jesus is mine. He's focused on God the Father. He's got peace. No matter how traumatic and stressful your week's been, God gives peace. Now, how do you protect yourself from Satan's attack? You keep your mind on Christ. You keep your mind on the Father. You see, Jesus is the one path. He's on the one path because he is the one path. We know this because John 14 tells us, Jesus said to him, I am the what? The way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Do you know in the Greek what the word the way means? Hodos, a way, a system of doctrine, the way of Christian faith. Every word in God's word is purposeful and intentional. There is nothing random or chaotic in the word of the Lord. This is the way our lives are to be patterned in peace based upon the word of God. So when he says going up, I want you to remember that they were in the region of Perea. If you recall, that's, that's just east of, uh, that's east of Judah and then by the Jordan River. We talked about that before, where, where in the Old Testament they had to make, they had to make a choice. Uh, the, actually, the, the two tribes and the half-tribe of Manasseh decided to stay on the east side. The others went to the west side, the blessed side. We all get to make that choice. So Jesus is leaving that, that region, and now he's going towards Jerusalem. Now, when he says going up to Jerusalem, actually from, from Perea to Jerusalem was about a 3,500-foot elevation. And you're like, okay, not a big deal. Not when you're driving a car, but when you're on foot and dirt roads, a 3,500-foot elevation is significant. So you are literally going up to Jerusalem. Now, people also said, I'm going up to Jerusalem. Like we say, I'm going uptown. Jerusalem was, was seen as the high spiritual city because the temple of God was there. So Mark 10, 32 continues, and he says, and Jesus was going before them. Like that is purposeful, not because he had the GPS in his hand and they're following. It is purposeful. You see, Jesus is going of his own free will. Jesus knows what's happening. Jesus knows his destiny. His destiny is to, to lose himself to save us. Jesus is going before them. It's very intentional to know that Christ is ahead of us, is ahead of you. He's already laid the path. He makes your path smooth and straight if you just stay on the path. It's not a path to restrict your freedom or fun. It's a path to give you peace and hope and love. That's why Jesus is up ahead of them. So, so we say, well, well, they all knew the way. It wasn't like there was a big DFW Metroplex highway system. But why Jesus, why does he go before them? Because you see, that's what shepherds do. That's what shepherds do. John 10 tells us, but the one who enters through the gate is the shepherd, uh, shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep recognize his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. After he gathered his own flock, he walks where? Ahead of them. And they follow him because they know his voice. What I want to tell you is, Jesus has already traveled this journey. Jesus is walking up ahead of us. Where we fall off the track is when we start looking back. We saw what happened to Lot's, life, Lot's wife. Not a lot's changed since then. A good shepherd leads and feeds his sheep. See, Jesus knew they were anxious. I mean, why wouldn't they be? It was the mouth of the shark waiting for he and the disciples. There was not a welcome greeting party like somebody that finished high school graduation. Yeah, the disciples and the other people were anxious. So Jesus set himself above and in front so they could keep an eye on him. Y'all, he still does the same thing for us. <clears throat> no matter what your situation is, keep your eyes on Christ. I want to give you as an as a, as a, um, equipping moment. You see, no matter how many people were following Jesus... It's still a journey that Jesus had to take on his own. Whether everybody followed him or nobody followed him, it was a journey, a destination that only Jesus could fulfill. What I want to tell you is your destiny is a calling. It's not a consensus. It's not a consensus. You see, what happens is people hear a word from the Lord and they start shopping it out for bids and opinions. Well, you know, the Lord told me something, something. What you thinking? What you saying? 
I want to encourage you that when the Lord puts that word on your heart, that word is for you. And sometimes, I'm going to tell you, when you're moving up in your calling, it means sometimes you're required to walk alone or walk away from those who aren't heading in the same direction. The challenge has always been, will you? Will you? And I want to remind you that, that in the time from the anointing to the appointing, those times can be tough. Scott uh, Hulbert, our elder, and one of our elders, we were praying over Asafi, and the Lord has put an, an, an anointing on this boy, but he hasn't received his appointment yet. And the time from the uh, anointing to his first appointing, that's where the character grows. Amen. That's where the character grows. Yeah. Don't, 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 don't fall. Don't fail in the linger. If you feel like the Lord's left you, I can assure you that he's never, he's never walked away. Maybe your attention's been diverted. Maybe you need confirmation on the word that you've heard from the Lord. You want to know if what God's asked you is in alignment? Well, then look at God's word. Has the word, the calling upon your life, is it consistent with God's word? If it's anything very, it ain't from the Lord. If it ain't biblical, it ain't from the Lord. What I want you to do is when you hear from the Lord, I want you to write it down. <clears throat> we get so weird about writing down. Listen, what is this? What is this? Thank you, Jesus, that someone wrote the word of the Lord. His word is worth writing down. And I'm going to tell you, and if you don't understand everything in the beginning or you miss a little bit, ask him to repeat it. Lord, I'm here. I'm ready to listen. God wants a relationship with you. Relationship is built on communication. It's not some holy mystery that, that we're not meant to understand. Like a, We get too wrapped up in like Raiders of the Lost Ark. Like I'm a simple person, so God gives me a simple message. He says, one point message a week. You try to do three, you're going to get mixed up. So we stick to the one message of the gospel. If you're looking for confirmation for the word the Lord gave you, write down what he told you. Ask him to repeat it. Learn to ask specific questions. Who, what, when, where, how, why. Lee and I have talked for years. We always use the example of digging holes. I, there was a picture of a, a dirt field and an older man and a shovel. And he's leaning there like this. And he's like, well, I prayed for a hole. And God's like, well, I gave you dirt and I gave you a shovel and I gave you the ability to dig it. But it's like, well, when do I dig? Those are the questions we're not asking God. Like, make it simple. Like, God, what hole do you want me to dig? And when and where do you want me to dig it? Before we launch off on some self-assigned mystery, take the time to press into the word of the Lord. Make sure what he's telling you is what he's telling you. Also, seek wise counsel if you're looking for affirmation. And folks, if you're married, I want to tell you, God, a promise for one is a promise for both. If the Lord has given you a specific word, he may not have given your spouse the exact word, but he will affirm that word with your spouse. I think about Moses and his wife. Moses was out doing big ministry. His father-in-law Jethro had to say, hey, hey, remember me? You remember your wife and your two boys? Those that didn't see the exodus? Those that missed out on the Red Sea? No, I'm bringing them home to you. I just want to reassure you, especially married folks, a promise for one is a promise for both. And just like Jesus, there's going to be times where you got to walk alone. Sometimes you have to walk away from the, the people closest to you. Sometimes our destiny, sometimes it can be a burden. But that weight of burden is actually gravity to keep you grounded. So Mark 10, 32. It says, and they were amazed, and as they followed, they were afraid. Now, I want to switch over from the New King James to the NLT. And it says, the disciples, it makes it a little clearer, vets it out a little bit. The disciples were filled with awe, and the people following behind were overwhelmed with fear. So, in the Greek, the word awe is thambio. It means to be astonished, to be amazed, struck out of your mind. And I still think that's a good thing. We should always be amazed at the goodness of God, at the word of the Lord. It should always bring revelation. And sometimes we should be just struck out of our mind. 
We should get shaken out of the mundane of the natural world by the supernatural world of the Lord. And then it says, the people following behind were overwhelmed with fear. That's to dread, to fear, to be alarmed. Now, why were both of these groups feeling this way? Well, I will tell you, both groups were being led by emotion, not by the word of the Lord. You see, the disciples, <clears throat> they've already been told twice, they're going to be told a third time what's going to happen. But they're still being uh, led by emotion. They're not being led by the Spirit, you see. And you know the group where it says the followers who were further behind, they didn't walk in awe. They walked in fear. I would, I would propose that the reason they were walking in fear is because of the distance between them and Jesus Christ. You see, the further they got from Christ, the more fearful they became. If you're dealing with situations in your life right now where there may feel like confusion or fear or, or, or just uncertainty, I, I'd suggest that you, you pep your step and get a little closer to Jesus the Christ and reading and praying and people who believe in Christ. I always encourage you, who's your five? It's a sociological construct. You're going to reflect the five people that you're closest to. You want to be a knucklehead? Hang around with five knuckleheads. You want to be a millionaire? Hang around five millionaires. You want to be a rock-solid believer? You hang around five other rock-solid believers. You know, when we're talking about the, the difference between fear and faith, fear being emotion-led and faith being God's Word-led, uh, Scott Holbert had shared this in our elders' meeting last week. This is the difference. Fear is believing something specific about the future that has not happened yet. That's fear, okay? You are believing something specific about the future that has not happened yet. And we get all fear. Oh, my goodness. Let me tell you what faith is. Faith is believing something specific about the future that hasn't happened yet. You see the difference between the two? Are you going to allow your emotions to lead you? Or are you going to allow God's word? To guide you. I would choose faith. It's the same circumstance. It's the same situation, but you get to choose faith or you get to choose fear. One's led by your emotions, the other's led by the word of the Lord. Now I will tell you, is there a reason for these folks to feel natural fear? Yes, there is. The religious elites, they wanted Jesus dead. They had to annihilate him. They couldn't just cancel a subscription. They had to, he had to go. And the people, the disciples knew this. They had been with Jesus with all these attacks, attempted stonings, and he knew that everybody was plotting against him. But I will tell you what God gives Jesus in that time and what he gives you in this season. From Philippians 4, 6, 7, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. So many times we find ourselves, how am I going to get out of this? How in the world am I going to get out of this situation? This is how. This is how. Go to God in prayer. He will guard your hearts and guard your mind. Amen. Amen. The supernatural love of God protects your thoughts and emotions from becoming dark and desperate. Left on our own desires, left on our own ability, left on our own uh, um, skill or, or personality, we're always going to default to the dark side. Stick to the light of Jesus Christ. Mark 10, 32 continues. Then he took the 12 aside again and began to tell them the things that would happen to him. Jesus is speaking prophetically to his disciples. Now, why is he doing this? Because he wants to connect his life and his future to the past Old Testament prophetic events. It is so important that Jesus makes them aware that this has already been spoken. This has already been spoken. There is nothing random about what's going to happen to Jesus. Everything has been spoken, but he's got to remind those old boys. So when it happens, they won't be like, well, that was crazy. They're going to be, oh, man, that was prophesied. We have that same situation we have that same ability. Too many people, we're worried about the end times. Worried about the end times. You want to know about the end times? Read the Bible. Read the book. It tells you 
about the end times. There should be no fear for believers right. in the end times. And I remind you all the time, because I'm asked all the time, are we in the end times? Yeah. Every second that passes, you're one second closer to the end times. And praise God for that. You see Mark 10, 33, Jesus says, Behold, we are going up again to Jerusalem. In the Greek, we are going up. It's anabiano, and it means mount upwards as smoke. Jesus is referring to where they're going as, as smoke arising. He's not talking about 3,500 foot grade elevation. This is the same word used in Revelation 8, 4. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hands. You see, Jesus knows, there is no doubt in his mind, that he is going up to Jerusalem to be sacrificed. He is the final sacrifice. That's his destiny. He understands. So the words that he's using are very specific to what's happening. I want to, I want to encourage us, allow our words to reflect Jesus. I want everything that we say to not be random or intentional. Sometimes Leah's like, you just talk too much. You just want to fill the silence with words. And you know what? She's right sometimes. <laughs> She's right. Sometimes I do. But you know what? When we speak to people, when we witness, when we talk to our kids and our spouses, let's make sure we weigh and measure every word. Every word. You see, what Jesus is doing, the disciples, they've got to be prepared. They've got to understand what happens. I mean, it's, sometimes it's easy to kick them around. You know, once we took off that over-religious, oh, the apostles, and yeah, they, they deserve their place. There's a, there's a place for them. They're actually in their, in their destiny right now. But at the time, there were just 12 folks like us trying to figure it out trying to figure it out. And they were in real time, and at times they felt like they were overwhelmed and, and, and under-informed, just like we do a lot of times. But you see, it's important that they understood what was happening. It's important for you to understand what is happening. You see, everything Jesus is doing is leading them to God the Father in his actions, in his words, in his teachings. Everything Jesus does points to the cross. So I want to challenge you. Does your life point to Jesus Christ? Like Jesus knows his destiny. As a believer, do you know yours? I don't mean what, what's going to happen tomorrow for breakfast. Or Do you know your eternal destiny? You should, because it's in the book. Amen. Amen. It's in the book. And you know, I, I, I always encourage, if there's doubt, if there's doubt, Connect yourself to a spiritual mother or a spiritual father Amen. and let them walk you through some of the, some of the points that maybe through, through, through sanctification and the process of moving glory to glory that you've just not arrived at yet. The Lord has got a house. This is a church filled with mothers and fathers, spiritual mothers and fathers. And they are aching, aching to disciple someone. Not hold a big Bible study in their house, but to sit down one-on-one -on -one over coffee and explain things, things you may not, you may be uh, hesitant to ask in a Bible study or in a church. I'm encouraging you, no matter what your age, no matter what your, your stage in the faith, connect yourself to a spiritual mother or father. Amen. I want everything in your life to be aligned to God's word. I want you to have the surety and the confidence and the boldness to know your destination. Even in the worst of your times, what do people see you reflect? Do they see the Christ or the crisis? You see, people, the gospel is more caught than taught. People watch your life. They watch how you respond. You see, it's easy to be happy in the good times. What matters is when times are tough. What matters is when your week is just stunk. What matters is when you can't wait for it to be done. But you know what you still shine? Jesus. Amen. Jesus. Mark 10, 33 says, And the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes. I want you to notice, as I know you have, Jesus often refers to himself in the third person. So why does he do that? 
Now, if we did that, that would be weird. If you ever heard me say, well, Scott said, if I'm saying, well, you know, Scott says we're going to, then somebody needs to just push me down and say, bro, you got to get a grip. But this is why Jesus refers to himself in the third person. He emphasizes his role. When he says the son of man, he's emphasizing his unique role as the Messiah and the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies. He is giving a prophetic tone. You see, Jesus isn't just guessing what's going to happen. He is giving them with specificity things that are going to take place. And they need to understand that Jesus is operating in the prophetic. He's also avoiding self-glorification. Jesus is consistently directing people away from him and back towards God the Father. Back towards God the Father. I do. You see those pictures all the time. Like, I got a sandwich for the poor. You know, like, no, don't do that. And then the third is through mystery and revelation. Number four is the disciples that they're going to come to know who he is through spiritual revelation rather than human comprehension. Like Jesus is telling them who he is, who he is. But when they get it is when it comes through spiritual revelation. You see, we can teach academically all day long, but until you experience the supernatural God, you never know the supernatural God. Now, Mark 10, continues, and it says, betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes. Now, we talk a lot about, about the Pharisees and the Sadducees, but somehow the scribes seem to, they seem to have slid under the radar. And in the Greek, the, 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 the scribes is it's grammatus, and that is where our word grammar comes from. They're recorders, they're writers, they're teachers, are interpreters of the law. And while all of our focus is usually on the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they're getting our boos and thumbs down, the scribes actually held a lot of influence over these guys because they were the experts in the law. They were the experts in the law. And of course, the irony is these people who, who love the law, learned the law, claimed to live the law, they actually failed to see the fulfillment of the law standing right in front of them in Jesus Christ the Messiah. You see, it's easy to lose perspective when you focus on religion instead of relationship. When you focus on the rules instead of the person in front of you. You know, another equipping moment. You're talking about, about losing perspective. You know, and we, as from in the church, we, you know, we always ask on the bigger picture of, of the, the body of Christ is, is why are people not coming to Christ? Like, why are churches closing? Do you know that a LifeWay study, a LifeWay research study, 148 Christian churches in America, 148 churches close every week. Every week. Almost 150 churches a week close in America. But I will tell you, most are promoting their goals, not the gospel. Amen, that's it. Not the gospel. I will tell you that God's word is good enough. God's word is good enough. Like if you're having trouble breaking through and witnessing the people, or make sure you're showing them God the Father and not yourself as a good friend. I know sometimes we want to disciple people. We want them to be our BFF, our buddy. But your job as a disciple maker is not to make a new best friend. It's to usher somebody in to the kingdom. What I want to share with you is from Acts 2, uh, 40, 41. Then Peter continued preaching for a long time, strongly urging all his listeners, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day, about 3,000 in all. What is Peter sharing with everybody? The gospel. He's sharing the gospel. What I will tell you is the gospel is good enough. The gospel is good enough. So I grieve over the 148 churches a week that close. I grieve. And there's a lot of dynamics that go into it. But what I, what I encourage this church, and, and we will continue because I am, the, I am the shepherd of this church, we will always stick to the word of God. The gospel is good enough. Mark 10, 33 says, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles. In the, in the Greek, the word death is thanatos. It's an extinction of life. It's not just passing away. It's an extinction. They had to, they had to crush Jesus. They had to crush the movement, the revolution. So why would the Jews actually hand him over to the Gentiles? That's the Romans. Well, in a nutshell, 
It was a very complex political environment at the time. You see, the Jewish elite, they didn't have the legal authority to execute anybody. They didn't. You see, the Jewish elite, they, didn't, they didn't also didn't want the common people, the Jews, to revolt against them. They're, paying, they're playing a PR game, a public relations game. Because you see, Rome, who ruled them, they only allowed the Jewish elites to, to have control, the control that they had, and that was to keep the common people quiet. Like, if y'all can pe- keep these people satiated, y'all can stay in charge. Like, y'all get the cool robes and the gold rings, but I want you to keep everybody else quiet. You know, you still find that today in this culture. The elites keeping the common people quiet. There you go. Yeah. Now, the other side, what, why the, why the uh, Jews had to give them over to the Gentiles was to fulfill Old Testament prophecy. That prophecy required, although uh, Rome was not mentioned by name, but that prophecy required the Messiah's suffering and his beating and his crucifixion. The Jews did not have legal authority to do that. So they had to give it to someone who did. And that was the ruling authority, which was the Romans. What I want to do, I want to lay these, I want to give you a couple scriptures. These are Old Testament scriptures. These are Old Testament scriptures. And I want you to see if you see Jesus and the crucifixion in these scriptures. The first is Deuteronomy 21. And I think I tried to make it a little easy. I bolded it. If a man has committed a sin deserving of death, he is put to death. And you hang him on a tree. That's crucifixion. This is Old Testament. This is what Jesus is attaching himself to. So the disciples realize, yeah, when he starts talking crucifixion, their minds should have immediately gone to Deuteronomy. Where else can their minds go? They go to Psalms 22. For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. This is Old Testament. This isn't, this isn't after the fact reporting. This is what Jesus, as soon as he's talking to them about what's going to happen to him, their mind should have gone to Psalm 22. They divide my garments amongst them and my clothing, they cast lots. Do you remember what the Roman soldiers did at the foot of the cross? This is Old Testament. Isaiah 53, 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. This is Old Testament. This is Old Testament. Do you see the gospel message in these writings? When Jesus is sharing what's happening to him, and these disciples were, they were Jews. Jesus is a Jew. They should know the Jewish law. So Jesus is telling them what's going to happen. Everything comes out of Old Testament prophecy. Now I want to jump over to the New Testament from the Gospel of the Gospel of Mark says Jesus, when he told his disciples, they would kill him. But Matthew uses the word specifically, crucify. Crucifix, crucifixion is a tool of who? The Roman government. You see, Matthew 20, 19 says, And deliver him to the Gentiles to mark and scourge and to crucify, and the third day he will rise again. Everything Jesus is talking about has been foretold, has been prophetically announced. It is so important for the disciples to know that. It is important for you to know that. So you don't just think they grabbed some random guy and they hung him on a tree. And then they came up with a pretty good story. That is not the situation. This has been foretold. It was actually, go back to Genesis 3.15. It's the first time God himself proclaims the gospel message. This is how far back the gospel message was told. It wasn't just a good idea or plan B. So Mark 10.34, and they will mock him and scourge him and spit on him and kill him. And on the third day he will rise again. See, Jesus is a good teacher, and he knows how hard it is for the disciples to fully digest what's happening. But what he's doing is every time, this is the third time that he's told them about his death. Every time, he's given a little more information, and a little more information, and a little more information. Go back through the Gospel of Mark, and you can see each time that he's predicted his death, he is giving a little bit more information. What I want to tell you, Ellie, if you want to come up, or, or Kurt, I'm sorry, what I want to tell you is, 
This is an equipping moment. This is the same way that God equips us. Amen. You see, kingdom progress, it often comes in manageable pieces. You see, we're so used to this microwave, instant gratification society. But I'm going to tell you, God don't work that way. We say, I want it now. I want it now. I want my reward now. You know what I want to tell you? This is something interesting. Of, of all the multi-million dollar jackpot winners, one out of three claim bankruptcy within three years. You want it now? There's a movie that says you can't handle it. This is the way God's kingdom works. You know what tensile strength is? When you're building, constructing a building, and they can only put so much weight based on the tensile, tensile strength of the foundation. You see, God's building your tensile strength. Ten years ago when the Lord led me out of my career, and he had, and he had given me a, a, a wireless microphone, my goodness, it would have been a disaster. I didn't have the tensile strength to carry the burden of what he had for my life. There's, there's callings on your lives. And it doesn't mean you're weak. It just means that the tensile strength has to be hardened so God can put the next layer of foundation. And then the next layer of foundation. Because see, every layer requires the bottom layers to be stronger. God's protecting you is what he's doing. I want to tell you, just so we understand, like why, is Jesus, why did he just tell him the truth? Because it's a hard truth to tell. It's a hard reality to understand. And Jesus, as a good teacher, is giving them a little bit and a little bit and a little bit as their characters are able to develop it and take it. Deuteronomy 7, 21, 23 tells us, Do not be afraid of those nations, for the Lord your God is among you, and he is a great and awesome God. The Lord your God will drive those nations out ahead of you little by little. You will not clear them away all at once. Otherwise, the wild animals would multiply too quickly for you. But the Lord your God will hand them over to you. He will throw them into complete confusion until they're destroyed. Now, in the Greek, that wild animals are demonic forces. If the Lord is moving you into a location and you step ahead of the Lord, you're going to find yourself under spiritual attack that you could have never imagined. Your tensile strength is not ready. The, the, the promised land, his people were ready to cross over. But he said, I'm going to give it to you a little bit by little bit. Otherwise, it's going to be overthrown. It's going to be overgrown. You're going to be overcome. This is why Jesus takes his time in your life. This is why when you've got a burning to go and evangelize, the Lord says, let's, word, let's learn the word first. Or if, you, or if you want to minister the gospel, he says, I need you to develop the compassionate heart of a father. This is why sometimes in your life, when you feel like you've been in the wilderness for 40 years, when you feel like you've been struggling in obscurity, God's doing a work in your life. Yes, he is hardening, firing up your tensile strength. So when he lays the weight, the gravity of that calling, it doesn't collapse like a house of cards. God's good. I just want to encourage you, if you feel like nothing's happening in your life, just ask God, are you in a season of character building? Because I will tell you, if God gave you everything that he's got for you, just like those multi-million dollar Powerball winners, failure. And God's not setting you up to fail. God's not setting you up to fail. Do not be in a hurry and do not worry about the work God's doing. Amen. Stay faithful, Amen. linger, yes. stay close to the Lord. His word for you is always good. He did not send his son to die for you, to pull the rug out from under your feet. So I will tell you that the one thing that the Lord has put on my heart is God's word was meant to let us know what's already happened. So you will know what will happen. There should be no fear in the promises that God has for you. So what I want to do, I want to, I want to read a prayer over the body. And, and, and I don't want to say it's long. I want to be a good steward of time. But I do. I welcome you to just, just sit where you are. If you want to stand to receive, I encourage you to stand. But, but if you want to sit to receive, I'd rather you, I'd rather you close your eyes and, and create some space so you're not distracted by the peripheral. I would ask you, that if you just, just take a moment to come into a posture to receive a word from the Lord.
the Holy Spirit's been sharing that we've, we've, got, a, we've, got, we've got some folks and there's still a, a little sense of timidity. Maybe, maybe wanting of boldness. Like I want to I wanna, wanna be bold, but I just not. I want to free you from that today. So Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you, recognizing that you are the God of courage and strength. Your word tells us that you have not given us a spirit of fear, but a power and love and sound mind. Today, I lift up those who struggle with timidity, with anxiety, and with self-doubt. Lord, we ask for your deliverance and freedom. We renounce any agreements that we've made with the spirit of timidity. We break its chains over our minds, emotions, and actions. Let your truth penetrate our hearts, dispelling every lie that whispers fear and inadequacy. Lord, empower us with your Holy Spirit. Fill us with boldness, confidence, and unwavering faith. May we walk in the authority you've given us as your children. Father, transform our minds. Replace anxious thoughts with thoughts of victory. Help us to see ourselves as you see us, loved, chosen, and capable. Let us meditate on your promises day and night. Lord, grant us the courage to speak up when needed, to share our faith, to stand for righteousness, and to encourage others. May our words be seasoned with grace and truth. Father, ignite a fire within us. When faced with challenges, may we step forward boldly, knowing that you go before us. We are more than conquerors through Christ. Surround us with fellow believers who uplift and spur us on. May we encourage one another daily. Remind us of your unfailing love. Perfect love cast out fear. We rest in your love knowing you are for us. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 <clears throat> so if we could stand as the body and I'll pray us out. And, and I do want to make a reminder. <clears throat> I'm speaking, I'm, I'm, we're praying about boldness. And, and, and uh, Hema and, and her team, they're, they're sponsoring a youth evangelism camp in June at the church. It is free for kids 8 to 18. I encourage if you've got kids or grandkids or, or friends of kids or you know kids, um, they need to be here. They need to be here to learn what it is to be bold, to share the word of the Lord. I encourage you. So, Lord, Father, we thank you. Mm. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we, we pray over our missionary team. Mm. Lord, we thank you for this, this time together. We are so grateful for this gathering of saints we are so thankful for the spiritual mothers and fathers. We are so grateful that you are laying a foundation for a multi-generational church that starts with the spiritual mothers and fathers. I thank you for this opportunity to experience the solid foundation of what you're creating at Five Stones Church. So, Father, we praise you. I pray a special blessing over the families here for the families that are not here today. I am praying for the folks that, are, that have been praying for a church home <clears throat> or just praying for the courage to walk into a church. I pray that we serve as, as those who will tear down the strongholds between fear of what they think the world says a church is and the reality of what God's house has become. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.